there's so much happening right now in the asset allocation arena. So we constantly challenge how to build a portfolio. We all grew up with 60-40 portfolios uh, and so forth. And I think right now, uh, given the latest math that we can use, we can really challenge what use are hedge funds. And I think the time is becoming a bit more ripe to start to challenge some of these basic foundations that we built as the location on. And we really try to be at the forefront of that. Welcome to the Allocators Corner podcast, a podcast exploring the institutional asset management trends in the Nordics. My name is Jonathan Ferdid, and I will guide you through conversations with some of the most high-profile asset allocators, fund managers, and asset management industry trend spotters in the region. In this episode, I had the opportunity to talk to Jonas Tulin, who is head of asset management at Eric Penser Bank. Jonas is an economist by training and joined Penser in 2017. At Eric Penser, Jonas is responsible for the management of the bank's discretionary mandates, which consists of a number of tailor-made portfolios. He also runs a couple of funds that are based on the same allocation strategies as within the tailored mandates. Jonas says he runs a very active strategy where the bank's so-called house view is challenged more or less every day. Unlike many of his industry peers, he is very vocal about his market view, which currently suggests that there is more room to run for equities, despite the long bull run that has been driving prices higher for the last 10 years. This is my conversation with Jonas Tulin. Jonas, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I wanted to start by just, well, giving giving a brief introduction of who you are. Um, yeah. Obviously, the reason you're here, you're head of asset management at Penser Bank. Um, but uh, what brought you there and, and what did you do before? I, I guess that could be a very long story. But, <laughs> but um, right before Eric Penser Bank, I was head of asset education at uh, Nordea. Uh, mm. Before then, I was head of research uh, and strategy at Nordea. Um, before then, uh, strategy in, in, in New York and, and trading, prop trading, and as well as in London. Um, so my background has always been uh, very keen on working close to the market, very keen on having free mandates. And what really brought me to a Pencil Bank is that last thing I mentioned, is, is a totally free mandate. That just envision that we can create a portfolio uh, for any given customer, a custom-made portfolio, which we populate with... Um, pretty much the best products uh, that we open up for free competition across the world. Mm. And I think that's the key to the success we've had so far in terms of of just outperforming our competitors. Um, And then we stress test this every single day and let everything compete every single day. Um, So that's that's part of the answer of of what brought me to Penser and a little bit on on my background. So it's always been my nose deep down into the the market trying to understand what's happening and, and why and how can we make money or should we try to, to, to safeguard ourselves? And when did you join Penser? Was that in- it was the autumn of 2017. Okay. Um, so, so it's been well, roughly a little bit over two years now. Yeah. And in terms of the mandate you run at Penser, mm-hmm. uh, what are, well, what is the size and restrictions of that one? Well, we actually don't really re- reply to the size. What, mm-hmm. I can, what I can say is that the growth since I started is about 270% up in terms of asset under management. So we had a tremendous growth. Uh, the team has expanded accordingly. Uh, we, we're basically taking a lot of junior quants um, from fresh from, from universities. And um, the restrictions are uh, quite few in the sense that we have an asset allocation, strategic asset allocation in terms of equities, fixed income, and so forth. And then it's really up to us to to populate these with, as I said, with the best products. Um, so we really don't have any restrictions in terms of we don't do equities, we don't do this type of fund investments or this type of direct investment. We, we can do pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you structure it in, in different mandates or is it one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, with uh, different mandates. Mm-hmm. So basically what we uh, have is a, in order to also, I mean, to be, be, be completely fair and, and, and transparent, in order to compete, uh, what we tell customers is that if you if you come and have a discussion with us and you have a pre- personal preference that they want 
let's just make something up. They don't want fixed income. They only want 56% equities. We will provide that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we, of course, have a, a deep discussion in terms of what are the risks uh, surrounded to this uh, this idea. Uh, how can we build a, a diversified portfolio and so forth? But we, what we really want to avoid and what we don't use are our investment profiles, uh, where you answer a couple of questions uh, and then you are giving a a, uh, uh, a preset asset allocation. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so much happening right now in the asset allocation arena, so we we constantly challenge how to build a portfolio. Um, we all grew up with 60-40 portfolios uh, and so forth. And I think right now, uh, given the latest math that we can use, we can really challenge what use are hedge funds. And now I'm talking hedge fund index. So obviously there are the good examples and bad examples. But for commodities, uh, can we even challenge from a mathematical point of view fixed income? And I think the time is coming, becoming a bit more ripe to start to challenge some of these basic foundations that we built as dedication on. Um, and we really try to be at the forefront of that and, and, and to try to see, can we actually increase uh, our, uh, our, our returns and also obviously uh, lowering risk by mm. working a bit more, more, more smarter on this. Mm. And you do that through a quantitative approach, so to speak, yeah. uh, given that you, you have a lot of quants Yes, we, we do. Team. I mean, the the um, I, I myself is not a quant. I, mm. I, I'm a, I'm an economist, uh, and so what we do is that we have a, um, a particular way of studying economics as well, where we we pretty much derive everything that we think. So we never go in uh, in, in any given day or, or make an assumption or or, or belief or a, a concern. We have to derive everything, and this uh, what I'm about to explain. We also show our investors. So basically we derive, if we're concerned about, let's just make something up in, in terms of um, the political risk in, in, in Europe, for example, uh, we derive that political risk, we analyze how it affects markets and we derive what positions should we take or we shouldn't take on this. And that means that we basically cover about 7,000 uh, macro data series each week. Uh, we have built about 1,400 models. Uh, we're covering 11 different academic schools, uh, school of thoughts, everything from modern mainstream macroeconomics uh, all the way to Austrian school, mm-hmm. in order to really capture uh, these paradigm shifts that happen in the market sometimes. We, we think the market is, is behaving in one way, and all of a sudden something happens, and it just turns on its head. Uh, I think QE1 and QE2 is a good example where QE1 was traded one way, mm. <laughs> QE2 in a completely different way. And what basically happened is that we, we changed paradigm. So we, we really need to understand everything in order not to be caught up uh, with, um, no, not really media, but, but more in terms of an overly nervous sentiment, for, for example, that I think we've seen sometimes this year, uh, quite, quite, quite a good, uh, good examples on, um, and, and really trying to derive what is actually happening. What are the recession, re- recession risks? Um, the trade wars are a great example, um, which I think a lot of people got nervous about, but we always scratched our head and said, why? You have to derive what are the effects. Then we can make a If I, was, if I was to do a forecast, I mm. can assume and I can be concerned and I can lower the forecast, etc. But if you're going to derive the direct effects of the trade war and translate it into a market effect, all of a sudden you, you start to find quite interesting patterns uh, that are not, in, in, in at least if you go back a year, uh, were not sort of the uh, consensus if, if, when you talked around uh, what was going to happen with the trade war. Mm. And in terms of the clients you have underlying, is that primarily high net worth individuals or is it what are the clients of, of Yes, well, we have everything from very large institutions mm-hmm. uh, to to high net worth clients uh, mm-hmm. so every, anything between mm-hmm. and and we make very sure that they're all treated fairly and equally uh, mm-hmm. so so whoever is in a different strategy let's say that We have one dollar and, and a billion dollar, but both are in, in global equities. We trade them equally on the same price, same liquidity, and etc. So we, we pretty much uh, build a system of bucket trades. Um, so I, I say the 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 uh, and of course we have everything in between in terms of institutions and 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 uh, and so forth. So it's a very spread um, uh, customer base. Mm. And you said it's it's very customized in terms of how you build the portfolios, but do you have like a base case portfolio that you built? Well, that is the model portfolio, so to speak, and then you you yeah. do carve outs from that. Um, yes, you, I think you can say that. I usually sometimes try to explain it that, that we do have those solutions, um, but we. 
sometimes I try to explain it's like Lego mm-hmm. pieces. Uh, that we can we can pre- build pretty much anything, uh, and it's really down to the dialogue between the uh, the advisor and the customer in terms of risk preference and, and the whole analysis of, of the customer to decide what risk are you comfortable with, uh, and how can we build the best portfolio for you as an individual. And then, if that happens to be a, a, a standard set of, of, of portfolio, then that's fine. Um, we we do use them, but predominantly we use them also for for marketing uh, just to show something. Um, mm. and and, and then we, um, and then we can build from that. Mm. You said that you're not uh, kind of the traditional. Um, you're not building the traditional way, so to speak. Is uh, if you were to describe the the construction of the portfolio and how you build around asset classes and regions, currencies, ex- exposures, and so on. What what mm. would you? How would you do, would you describe that? Well, basically, um, the, the whole architecture is is based on on Esma's advice on on how to build a, a, a an asset allocation from a MIFID two perspective. Mm-hmm. So basically, what I did is we took the um, the law uh, and, and we broke it down in, in terms of variables that we need to check the box. So if they say that we should uh, treat everything objectively and openly and derive everything, then that's what we're going to do. Uh, so pretty much what we decide to do is that we will not adopt a process to MIFID 2 we're just going to build it on MIFID 2 and actually I would advocate I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of MIFID 2 because actually what MIFID do is they give you a handbook on how to build a very good asset allocation you have to do a lot of work uh, and, and for some it might be it might be um, a bit more difficult to adjust given the the legacy of, of products or legacy of an organizational structure and so forth but if you can build it from scratch or, or, or rebuild mm. you can actually do quite quite interesting things and, and turn things on its head sometimes um, as I mentioned I think a good example is that uh, in in uh, in our global equity portfolio, uh, we stress just uh, forty thousand different equity strategies every single day, and that's all regions, all all sectors, long short spreads, everything, all the globes uh, products are in there, and it's quite. Uh, I shouldn't say easy, but it becomes a little more interesting trying to beat uh, traditional asset allocation that might be fixtured around a couple of hundred actively managed funds. Mm. Where we can go in and, and pinpoint very narrow strategies um, and and uh, and trade those. Um, the same goes with the currency overlay. Um, if we believe that the um, CIEC would collapse as as we did uh, back in, in January 2018. We take away all the currency exposures. It's an active position for us. It's not an inactive position for us. Um, and and wait, when you say active, how how active is that? Is that are you reviewing it every week or every? Well, you, you, yeah. you're more or less said that it's every day, but but uh, it, it is. Uh, I mean, this is why it probably helps to be an, an, a, a bit a, a bit of a nerd on, on this. Mm. I mean, I, I can't help myself. I mean, we evaluate these things. Uh, I, I guess we're very, uh, in a sense, we're people of a competitive nature. So for us, it's it's actually a bit fun to see. Well, when can actually CX starts to beat someone in the currency market, and 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 who can beat the CX? And then build analysis around that, um, and and uh, it's been a one-way street since we put down that that strategy. But it is a strategy that we evaluate um, every week. I would say, and perhaps not every single day, but but every week for sure, because we have to be constantly aware of it's the customer's money, and they should have a right to any given day call us up and say, "What have you done now with the CEC exposure, and how can you how can you derive and prove to me that this is the optimal CEC exposure that you have given me." So we have a constantly ready sharp pack analysis that we can go through. And just to build that structure actually helps us take better positions, I think. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the overall investment process, given that mm. you're a bit of a macro guy uh, from mm. the start, is, is is it more of a top-down view that you start with and then build from there? Or is it... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, com- uh, uh, complete. I mean, we do have uh, bottom up perspectives in terms of uh, I have two colleagues, Pontus and and, and Pieter, that do more more bottom up. But we really try to differentiate and, and separate uh, the, their managers, for example, on on a, one specific alternative fund, Pensa Yield, and the other one is on Swedish equities. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we sort of we don't lock the door, but that's a separate process. Uh, when we do the asset allocation and the tactical allocation on on the global mandates, it's a pure or bottom-down uh, process. And it really, um, uh, it doesn't has to be, but I think it actually opens a lot of doors. I think global macro is, I mean, this year has been quite straightforward. Mm. Um, I mean, we are lucky sitting here today that we've been, you know, proven right on a, a lot of calls, which makes it easier to talk to, uh, mm. talk w- about. 
But I think it's important to, <clears throat> to constantly come back to that. Um, how do you derive it? How do you prove it? Um, so basically, when we ever do a trade, uh, we usually end up with some 20 slides of macro product analysis, global scanning of what's the best product and so forth. Um, fully aware of that very few customers probably are that interested. They're going to read through all the 20 slides. Mm. But I think it has to be there uh, in order to be fully transparent of what are we doing and why are we doing what we're doing. Mm. Uh, and, and did it lead to a good decision or a bad decision? And in terms of how you express your ideas, ideas is that mainly through index, indexi, indices, or is it through funds, or is it uh, yeah, uh, a variety of the? It's a it's a variety. We usually say that um, predominantly we we end up trading ETFs, mm-hmm. um, and, and and the reason for that is that uh, the, the ETFs, I guess, the, um, back some five ten years. Is more passive on indices, but right now we have so many strategies that are wrapped in an ETF format. Uh, which means, if I want to buy U.S. home builders that, that we bought a while back, uh, it's about six companies, um, and that's the ETF. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're sort of way past the days where we, we did the S&P 500, for example. Yeah, there are so many alternatives out there that we um, we, we 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 like to look at, but. Uh, I also want to point out, we don't discriminate uh, against actively managed funds. It's just that for the time that we've done this now for about two years, they haven't made it into the equity portfolio yet uh, because there's always, or so far, mm. it's always been the case that there's one or a couple, uh, quite often a couple of hundred uh, ETFs that just are better, more stable, less downside risk, more upside return, cheaper, and more liquidity, tighter, bid ask spreads and so forth. Is it then for us, it just makes sense to go on the, on, on the ETF space. Mm. And in terms of how you model risk, is do you set like a performance return target and then model risk from, from that return target? Or how do you reason behind uh, yeah. return uh, and risk? No, we, 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 we always start by going back to the customer dialogue. Yeah. What, what risk is the customer... Um, what makes them maybe to sleep at night, basically. And as soon as we have that risk number, we can backtrack uh, historically what what type of equity proportion would this lead to. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting you mentioned, I mean, in terms of of risk, I mean, you quite often we go back to standard deviations, but it's something that we constantly evaluate. And now we have, I think... We're, we have one, but we might be up to about three different research groups from Royal Institute of Technology in order to evaluate uh, is it time to improve and, and use the latest math in terms of, our, I mean, I mean, standard deviation is pretty old school. Yeah. And uh, there, are, there are new ways of, of looking at this. Uh, can we uh, in, uh, incorporate them? And what are the effects uh, mm. that we t- need to evaluate? Um, but, but for the time being, um, we left with the return vault uh, and try to find what is the customer happy with. Mm. And then obviously what we also do is that uh, that becomes more on, on the technical market side. If we, for example, sense or, or believe that we can see that vault will pick up, then obviously we can again go out in the market and, and hedge ourselves by just buying the vault. We can do the vault curve, we can short vault, we can do pretty much anything. Um, yeah. Uh, again, what's happening in the ETF space in the last couple of years is pretty extraordinary. You know, mm. what, what it can do, uh, it's, especially on the fixed income side, I would say. Mm. Um, yeah, is is that how you model also tail risk? Is that is that the way you mm. you you protect yourself through volatility more or less? Uh, you, you buy volatility it, or you sell volatility? Yeah, it could, it could could be. It doesn't have to be. I mean, mm. we, there, there are different ways that we, we looked at it. I mean, for a couple of positions that we used quite frequently last year when, mm. when we went into this, the dire end of 2018, we were long Swiss franc. Uh, we were short euro stocks. Um, and we had Japanese yen and we had gold, um, which is sort of it's a little bit of a variety uh, in order to find the right portfolio mixture. And then... Uh, in uh, it was between Christmas and New Year's, uh, we decided, okay, that was it. Uh, January is going to be a, a great, and 2019 is going to be a great equity year. Um, because the data traded, we can take them all off uh, in an instance and go uh, and overweight equities quite rapidly. Mm. So it really it co- goes back to, <clears throat> is the market paying attention on the on the franc, for example, or is it a yen? Uh, that, then we like to listen to that in order to just to have an easier time to, to make money and make the hedge work. Mm. We will come back, come back to that, but what is the market telling you right now? Is that positive? Positive. <laughs> in, in in one word, in one word. No, we've been uh, we've been uh, as I said, you know, humbly we've been, been been fortunate enough to to be be on the right side of things this year, and 
uh, and, and also actually last year. So, so so far so good because I think there, there's this year this it seems to be a a. A, a tremendous bull market in being pessimistic um, mm. and we never really quite understood why if you actually look at the underlying numbers um, but I know that we're a bit on 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 the um, sticking our heads out there but but again 7,000 times here each week we couldn't find the risk of recession um, and we still can't find it mm. you mentioned that you're well you're you're stuck with this uh, discretionary mandates that you run and you you're fine with that because it gives you some sort of flexibility but wouldn't it be nice to have a fund also to to offer the, yeah. the audience we we do have a fund a usage fund mm-hmm. um that is is following uh, the the um uh, sort of the the uh, medium risk port- okay. uh, portfolio it's called pensa dynamic um obviously being a usage fund it has its own limitations yeah. but 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 still uh, it's doing quite well it's top 11% on sustainability um and it's not even marketed as a sustainable fund uh, we try to we're gonna come back to that but we try to incorporate that in all decision making we're doing mm. um and we have some uh, ideas up uh, in our sleeves <laughs> on what we're gonna launch next year mm-hmm. uh, so we, maybe we kind of come back to that question um but, but it's, it's never it's never gonna be a retail product in the sense that you can access it through the platforms here in Sweden and Well, you you can actually buy it today okay. already, but but the, you you have to tell the uh, the 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 bank uh, that okay. I want to buy this fund, and then they had to meet you. But they might not be all willing to put it up on the platform to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Yeah, traditional Swedish banking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And in, in terms of how you how you benchmark yourself, what is your benchmark? Yeah, uh, we because we're applying an absolute return yeah. kind of sense. What we decided to do is, okay, let's just try to open up again for competition. Let's mm-hmm. just say, okay, we, if we have an, let's say we have an allocation of 45 or 20, whatever, uh, 45% equities, we know that there are products out in, in Sweden with the same equity allocation, with the same investment mandates. Mm. Roughly on the allocation of 45 equities, at least 25 uh, products. And basically what we do then is we calculate their return and, and use an average of that uh, and say, okay, are we better than the average or, or worse or, or do we beat them yeah um and then we have a um, like if you if you were to refer to like stock picking in sweden then obviously we, we compare to to a benchmark um but but otherwise we, we like to compare to to investable alternatives for for the customer um and then we do that each week uh, and we send it out to everybody who's interested in, in in a sense i mean did we get things more or less correct during the last week compared to to our competitors and what does the history look like going back mm-hmm. and you mentioned sustainability um, how do you incorporate that into your allocations and your investment process yeah and basically we, we make a sustainable analysis on, on each and every investment that we do mm-hmm. um, but we also make a clear distinction of what is a sustainable product and what is not a sustainable product if we start with the non-sustainable product you know, we make an analysis on the sustainable effect of the investment but in, in, in that is more of a, a reporting it's not so to speak guiding mm-hmm. if you return to our attention to what we actually label as sustainable then things becomes i guess a bit more more serious in the sense of deriving again come back to okay let's derive what we actually mean with sustainable mm. and then we have very harsh criteria on on sri for example in terms of, of, of the values in terms of uh, tobacco and, and and firearms and so forth but also in that sort of what is commonly referred to as negative screening we also look at the supply chains uh, so so i think it's quite important not only to look at the company who might be producing a, a, a handgun mm. but you also look at who is doing their branding who is doing their their supplies who is doing their logistics who is doing their 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 um, accounting and so forth mm. so really trying to get this life cycle thing and, and that is done on all the investments and we have a, a minimum requirement of 98% uh, that we want to cover uh, which is a lot higher than, than 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 some other players are using but we think again we want to be pretty much trying to leapfrog uh, a lot of the competition in that sense and that's the negative uh, screening and then you have the UN goals that we've broken down to 37 38 different variables and those are quantified on a production code level following gigs and that's quite important because obviously that's what the taxonomy and the coming law will, would like us to do. Yeah. So what we decided to do is, is just do that from the beginning. 
Um, and now I'm, I mentioned 37, 38 data points. We can actually expand that with 160 more. And so we can really go into the nitty gritty detail and have full transparency. And also, again, coming back to, to our investors, show to them each and every part of the ESG, the ESNG, what are we actually meaning? In terms of CO2, uh, we calculate with, with Potsdam University definitions and we, we show them, I mean, what, is this, what does this mean in terms of tonnage, uh, in terms of can we translate into cars, so we can make it t- more tangible. Because I think what I'm trying to not fight against, but we're trying to be a counterbalance to is this notion that sustainability has been used um, quite a lot as a, a marketing tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we really want to walk away from that. And I usually call it just make sustainability for real mm-hmm. uh, and derive what do we actually mean. And again, going back to that, all the investments has to be, and pretty much all the investments has to be be accounted for. Mm-hmm. Um, so so f- that's how we incorporate it, mm-hmm. uh, which means, again, a, a lot of data. Um, but but then again, it's, it becomes really interesting when you can start to find the the, um, um, the patterns out there. And roughly, I think we're left with 22 to 25% of the global uh, companies that we can actually invest in, given the positive screening. Because mm-hmm. again, we want to we wanna be able to be a part of this evolution in terms of uh, providing more capital to the leaders in each industry r- rather than laggards. Mm. And I guess you're, you're not seeing the, the ESG part as a restricting power in this sense that, well, yeah. you, either you have an ESG compliant portfolio and you get worse returns or you mm. have the, well. Yeah, that, that can certainly be the case. Mm. Uh, when we look at, again, we, we went back to um, um, uh, Royal Institute of Technology here in, in, in town action and made them help us to do some some math on this. Mm. And then you're going through what's been written in academia previously and so forth. And I think the, the uh, there's absolutely a risk of worsening returns if you apply negative screening and stop with negative screening. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, that we, we can sort of derive that. And, and I, should, I should probably not say prove, but that's provable. Mm. Uh, Uh, in that sense. Mm. Uh, but if you actually take this one step further and do the positive selection process as well, then all of a sudden you actually get a high return on, on the same, let's say S&P 500 or whatever, mm. than you would get if you didn't do it. Mm. Um, so basically, the, the you should sometimes explain this whole sustainability concept as another foreign French factor. Uh, it happens to be called sustainability. It could be called X, Y, Z. It's a great way of, of, of finding companies out there that are really uh, that are working really well um, mm. and again also delivering a transparency um, that is well, hopefully the future of, of, of these things mm. and in terms of data uh, are you using external providers to, to get all these ESG yes, data? Yes uh, we do I mean the, the, this comes back to uh, we don't have an, an internal ESG or sustainable uh, person or so forth we, we rather go on the data mm. Uh, as such, we, we do uh, get data from from uh, Bloomberg, Sustainalytics, MSCI, and so forth. So we yep. rather put our money there uh, to get as much uh, decision um, data as possible. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, when we invest, we, we drive the, the sort of the active ownership through uh, the products that we invest in. Um, so so um, there might be a different approach, but we we get out from this is this full transparency of what we're doing. What do mm. we refer to as investable? Oh, sorry, sustainable. Mm. And I wanted to get back. We have discussed the way you work around the portfolio and how you express your views. But you have something called the, the house view that yes. you that you send out quite frequently. I don't know how frequently, but is that on a every single day? No, every single day. No, <laughs> no but but it's um, what we've done is that we we want to make sure that people understand that what we say uh, in, in this format or whatever format is what they have in their portfolios. Mm. Um, basically, in, in my career, I had different jobs where it's always this whole house view is a bit confusing. There are a multiple house views in some instances. Uh, what we've done at Eric Pencil Bank is the same work I did at Nordea. We're just gathering the bank around one house view. And uh, so, whenever we say that we are bullish this or we're bearish that, people should know and understand that's actually what we have in your portfolio. Mm. Um, by that, we are a lot more accountable for what we're saying. Uh, we can't just go out uh, on a whim and say that, well, we think it's quite bearish now in India, for example. Mm. Uh, it, it, it has to be for real. Mm. Uh, coming back to this transparency and accountability. So so the house view is, is published um, every month. 
uh, but it's updated um, well, pretty much. Well, yeah, I should say it's evaluated uh, every day uh, to see, I mean, did we get this right? Uh, do we have to change something? And if we change the house view, we would tweak it. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't change that much of a macro. It doesn't move that quickly, mm. unfortunately. Um, and then, then we tweak the portfolios accordingly as well. Mm. So it, it sort of has to fit together mm. uh, in that sense. And is the house view something that you introduced when you when you started, or was that already in the process when you? When well, you we had a, a great economist who who went into retirement, mm. uh, and basically we sort of gave, that gave us sort of a, a playing book in the sense, okay, how we want to construct this now? Should we uh, do the traditional way of, of of hiring an economist and so forth? And we decided to, to no, but we let's let the asset management take care of this mm. uh, in order to get this again coming back to this transparency. So when we go out and in the media and say that we are, for example, for this week where we're bullish Swedish GDP, I mean, um, then we have actually taken a position on it. Mm. Um, so we really want to avoid is this situation where you have one economist saying one thing, a strategist saying a different thing, and the fund manager, for example, or the portfolio manager is doing a third or fourth thing. Mm. Uh, because then obviously you as an investor, uh, it's very hard to understand why am I gaining or why am I losing money. Mm. And if we look at the current house view, how how does that look, and what is the reasoning behind it? Yeah, it's been uh, pretty much unchanged since the beginning of the year. Um, okay. I mean, the beginning of the year in January was the big call uh, the for for 2019 for us, where we uh, went to maximum overweight uh, in global equities, and um, and since then we've been increasing risk, even though keeping of of, of course a close eye on, on vol uh, through through uh, FX <laughs> and, and and CDSs and so forth. Um, but the house view has been very constructive. Um, we started the year on, a, on an elevated risk in terms of of, of recession uh, recession risks, but the trend or, or the leading indicators were clearly going aggressively downwards, uh, meaning lower recession risks, and and they've been falling ever since. So each week when we get new data from from Fed, for example, the recession risk is just falling away uh, constantly. So it's been a very good year um, for for equities and, and and for the house view. Um, and sometimes I, I challenged my colleagues in the industry and. Say well, if there was supposed to be a recession, can you derive it? I mean, mm. what are we looking at? Uh, and for us, it's not enough to show a graph of ISM and GDP. Well, we know there are about 40 different business services you have to ke- keep an eye on in the US. ISM is always the most bullish. It's also always the most bearish. <laughs> the other 39 are turning around and turning up since March. Mm. Why on earth should we stare on on ISM? The market isn't looking at ISM, so it's, it's always making that link, which I think is sort of the um, The sweet spot for us is this intersection between macro and, and markets. It's it's fairly tricky, uh, and it has to be derived. It has to be mathematically. It has to be econometrically and derived. Uh, otherwise, you the risk I would think, or I would argue, is that you would end up in thinking and believing, uh, and, and we can't manage other people's money on on thinking and, and believing. Mm. Um, at least that that's that's not what Eric Pencil Bank is standing for. So so we really want to be uh, nitty gritty on this. Um, So, so on your on your question, I mean, it's reviewed every single day. Mm. And in terms of markets being a bit stretched or very stretched in some cases, mm-hmm. if you look at the the long bull run in in equities, for example, is that something that you at all can incorporate into your decision making process, or is yeah. that just yeah? It, it is. I mean, I usually uh, uh, I haven't found a good word for this, but, but obviously, as an asset management, you go through different paradigms in a, in an investment year depending on how the market and and the macro is turning out. And sometimes I, I call this luxury asset management, which is probably mm-hmm. a really bad word for <laughs> for what we're doing. But but it's in terms of if we had a great run on an underlying set of, of investments, uh, we stress test them every single day. So pretty much every day we walk into the office, we have green or red flags on all uh, all our investors' um, uh, accounts and each of the, all of their underlying investments. And the reason for that stress test, which I think is really crucial to our, to our methodology, is that I want to know if we have an investment that all of a sudden isn't keeping up with the industry, I mean, it become too stretched or, yeah. I shouldn't say industry, I mean, imagine a benchmark of some yeah. sort. Um, then that's where we're going to focus, uh, and obviously uh, that's when we uh, had a great um, help from from screening these forty thousand alternatives out there because there's always another sector that's doing really well, and and then that might actually be a clue that it's time to shift from one good investment, which a neat profit, locking that profit and turn into a new exposure. 
Mm. Uh, all, all the, even though I'm, I'm constantly come back to this, I, I sense now with this stress test and evaluation, it's also very important to always keep in mind the cost of the switch. Uh, and we also always derive what is the cost. Uh, so the 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 the, um, the upside for the customer obviously has to outweigh the, the the switch. That means that we don't trade more than I would say between one or twice a month. And now it's been just made a trade uh, this week, and it was a month before. Because hopefully we should be able to find such solid trends that we can, I shouldn't say lean back, but but in, in the eyes of the consumer, lean back and and, and enjoy the ride. Um, while we are always working on, on stress testing mm. these things. And obviously, by doing this, we also find strategies that we're not interested in, in touching. I mean, for the past three months, the, the Pakistan uh, stock exchange has been the best. Mm. Uh, we have not invested in, in Pakistan. We haven't invested in, in marijuana last year either. Um, so, so it's really about, about also being able to see winning trends and stepping away and say that we will not include this into our portfolio. We can't get the macro to work or we think it's against an, an, an ethic policy that we want to stand for as a bank. Mm. What would you say is the most crucial factor that you look at right now and that would make you change your mind if, if something happened? Oh, it's a, it's a number of factors. Yeah. Um, uh, the the uh, each week we send out some thirty uh, forty pages of which is a very top 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 of an iceberg of, of what yeah. we're looking at. Yeah. We're really trying to constantly drill down into the underlying recession risk. What country or what region should we really be careful about? What what should we stay out of? Mm. Um, I usually mention this that we we haven't owned eurozone equities uh, through this year. It's been a, a good strategy so far. Eurozone has been picking up quite rapidly, um, mm. led by Germany and then autos and, and banks. Um, is that something we, we should look at? I mean, that's that's a nitty gritty we need to stress test. On on, on the downside, uh, that, that we're looking at where we, we constantly check out, you know, leading indicators. And for us, we don't use leading indicators produced by OECD, for example. What we are, we are building is leading indicators of the leading indicators. I usually say that when when you look at ISM or, or PMI, we have to trade where those will be in four months, or three months, or four months. And that's the, how we have to derive the data. Um, and if those were to turn south, then we'll be concerned. Mm. Right now, we're still in this, uh, this this very sort of sweet honey, honey spot when we have a trough in the global economy. Uh, we, we, we saw that trough back in January. It's been fairly manifested now. Now PMIs are starting to wake up, which gives us another good solid three, four months of, of, of a good PMI and ISM readings. And then really evaluate 2020 when that comes around the corner and see will the trough uh, go into a, an, an expansion or will it wither away and, and sort of plateau or, or fall back. Um, right now, when we look into 2020, we, we see a plateau rather than anything else. Mm. So we, we, it's a constant work. Yeah. On that. And and in terms of, well, you mentioned 2020, but but looking ahead, what, what do you see will, will drive the economy forward and or or not uh, so to speak is is what are your projections more or less for the next maybe not next year but coming three years so to speak yeah we we also produce obviously uh, gdp forecast and all that uh, and and we see this year as the the trough as i said mm. uh, we're going to have a, a rebound and i think it really go, comes back to different countries have different growth engines that we we monitor um one growth factor that i think Uh, we can, I can mention two examples of growth factors that we are we are working quite closely with. Is obviously home building, house building in the U.S., which I think yep. was one key reason why people missed the strength of the GDP. They were too focused on on, on um, I don't know what they were focused. <laughs> I can't answer <laughs> for other people. Maybe just too concerned and nervous about 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 about, about um, uh, trade war and so called trade war or something. But they completely missed the rebound in housing, which is really strong. Um, so obviously that's a key for the U.S. going forward: consumption, as to always, and and housing. If we lock in consumption and housing, we are pretty good idea of where GDP is going. We threw in inventories on that, and then we pretty much know exactly where GDP is going. Trade balance, it's it's nice. It's not really that crucial for, for the US. If we go a bit closer to home for, for Sweden, for example, uh, for the last two quarters, uh, net exports has been the prime driver. Um, obviously now what we're expecting and also what, what is, which is our house view and belief is that the, the CEC weakening that we've seen now for such a long time and also the, the lower yields 
will support their GDP in Sweden a bit more than people expect. Mm. So we turn from being uh, quite quite negative and that Europe is going to lag the US and, and China, which has been sort of the focus uh, for, for our returns this year, to actually now also um, putting up Swedish equities uh, to, to uh, as much overweight as we can, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's... Um, Uh, and then, of course, if you look at China, I used to mention something completely different. Yeah. Um, when we look at Chinese data, obviously we 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 try to look in all the national data, and we, we try to do traditional modeling there, but also to putting in like you know cement, steel, and electricity usage. Um, like a lot of people are looking at. Um, but really, in order to make an investment work uh, on on the equity side, um, we really need to focus on the three vehicles of financing: and social financing, uh, repo market operations. And liquidity injections and when we found which we think we have found uh, good ways of predicting and analyzing those then we actually use that for for, for understanding um, um, where, where GDP and, and the equity market is going mm. but but I should also be totally honest with it because it sounds um, we, we, we're quite comfortable in my methodology but we also have blind sides in our methodology mm. uh, where we can't get data um, we won't invest mm. Which means that there are part, certain part of the asset universe on, on the globe as such that we do not enter uh, through this uh, limitation. There's sort of a, a uh, something we have to give up uh, in order to, to have um, excessive returns uh, versus our competitors, I think. Mm. And in terms of central banks, your views on that? I mean, is that also a blind spot when it comes to interventions and... Or, or is that something that you actually take yeah. into account? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and uh, pretty much we focus on different angles of, of, of central banks. Right now, uh, we are doing a lot of, of modeling work trying to figure out and also to try to understand and also figure out how we can be ahead of the market and understand liquidity concerns in the US, for example. Mm. We think we actually uh, just the other day came up with a way that seems to be, might not be the perfect answer but it is what is moving the the uh, the uh, the rate market and, and that for us is a little bit of the uh, the um The, the truth in that sense that we need to to get get the market right, uh, but obviously we look at also the broader aspects as central bank balance sheets. Uh, we do that for all central banks in the world. We look at the rate policies. We do that for all central banks in the world. And it's actually an interesting uh, topic that that we we know that for for about a year ago, uh, central banks turned around and started to cut rates aggressively. And it seems to be that we, we a part, certain parts of the market start to discuss this really a bit more in, in the heated debate when it was time for the ECB or the Fed to do something. But six months before them, people were already acting on, on what happened last uh, year. Um, mm. the, this whole slowdown that we saw, saw in Q4 last year. That for us was a key reason to be positive for 2019. And and uh, I always find it very interesting. We can see all this stimulus, all this action being taken, and it's completely unreported. And we only focus on Fed and the, uh, and the ECB. Obviously, they are the most important, so it's quite natural reason. But there's so much happening underneath that that is really interesting. Um, And, and and that's I wouldn't say that we 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 seek to be contrarian, but I think that data has a tendency to to uh, sometimes be be a better truth teller. Mm. And going into next year, what would you say are the biggest challenges that you will face or potentially face? Um, well, I think every day is a challenge <laughs> to, find, <laughs> to try to find a bit more more return in that sense. I mean, I think part of the reason is the success we had this year. I mean, we we were in a, in in a forty five percent equity portfolio. We we should make five to seven percent, and we've done sixteen percent this year. So obviously. The level of expectation from our investors might be a bit uh, encouraged by this mm. year, uh, which we have to to manage uh, going in, going into a new year. Um, we do think, and we start to see some early signs that we will have a run on in involved. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, hopefully, that should be short term. Um, and then I think uh, after this whole. Uh, re- recession anxiety is leaving the market. We we run into the next big topic, which I guess will be the U.S. election um, yeah. of of next year, and and how do we trade that and so forth? We already know that the market is is nervous uh, when certain Democratic presidential candidates uh, becomes the um, oh when they make it to the top of the polls. Mm. We also know what sectors you should watch out from then, and just by the fact that we already have the playbook. 
it makes me a bit nervous. Okay. Because that means the playbook probably won't work. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. if it was that easy, we, we, we should already be, we should be over and done with it for, for the time being. So I think that will be evolve during next year. We're going to have this kind of inter intersector uh, plays going on where, where people are jumping around. Um, so, so I think that could be a bit of a, an interesting time. Jonas, thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me.